Seth Hopkins here today. You know Seth for, we were talking last night, we had dinner for 16 years, I guess. He's the executive director of the Booth Museum. Seth, thank you for coming. I'm happy to be here, Mark. I'll tell me everything about you in the next 10 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm sorry. We're going to do this for about an hour. Well, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I've, I've filled more time talking about less in, in my <laughs> lifetime, so that's, that's fine. We can do that. You know, we have known each other a long time, and we've played golf together, and we've been in places where we just get to talk. But I don't really know all your backstory. Like, I don't even know. You, did you grow up in Maine? Is that's that, correct. Yeah. That's correct. So, uh, yeah, I was born in central Maine, uh, a little town called Ripley, believe it or not, uh -huh. which is next door to Dexter, which is where they used to make some nice shoes. But uh, with NAFTA and all that, uh, they, oh don't, God. they don't make shoes anymore there. Yeah. And uh, so the town's not nearly as vibrant as it was, and it wasn't vibrant to begin with. So, you can so it was imagine. a small town, a little town. Yeah, Ripley, my hometown is 425 when, oh, I'm, wow. when I'm home. And uh, Dexter was about 4,000. And uh, the nearest movie theater, fast food restaurant, was almost an hour away in Bangor. And um, I grew up wanting to be a sportscaster. I love sports, love being around it. Uh -huh. Wasn't any good at any of them. Uh -huh. And um, so I figured out my way to be involved was to be a sportscaster. And I started doing that when I was 15 years old. Uh, as soon as I got my learner's permit, I was going and doing games for a local radio station in Dover, Foxcroft, Maine. And what kind of games would these be? Uh, mostly high school basketball, football, baseball. Um, but the owner of the station was pretty entrepreneurial, and uh, anything he thought he could sell a hundred bucks worth of advertising on and pay me twenty to go do, mm -hmm. he would do. <laughs> and uh, so we did candle pin bowling on the radio. We did the Fourth of July parade on the radio. <laughs> and you were the broadcaster for that. Sometimes, yeah, I mean, you yeah. know, there were other guys working there, right. but um, um, we did like local softball league tournaments on the radio um the best one of all was we did the moose lottery <laughs> this is only in maine maine and montana maybe yeah and what's that tell me about that well so the first year they're going to have a moose lottery to give away a thousand hunting licenses to mm -hmm. bag a moose because the moose had just overgrown the state and people were getting killed in accidents with yeah, moose. Sure. And uh, so they're going to thin out the herd some and make them a little more scared of people. So they sold uh, tickets. I think the in-state ticket was like 25 bucks. If you're a resident in-state, you can buy a ticket for 25 bucks. And they were going to give away 900 of those. And if you're out of state, the ticket was like, I don't know, $150, $200. Mm -hmm. They're really sticking it to them. And they're only going to give 100 of those. Mm -hmm. Again, it's the way Maine people would think. Right. You know, the Flatlanders <laughs> get, get. Yeah. Give them less, even though you're going to make way more if right. you give them more. Right. So um, it was a big deal up in our part of the state because a lot of people hunted and were excited about getting a permit and wanted to get a moose and so on. And so the owner of the radio station decided this would be great. They're going to call the numbers at the <laughs> state armory. And they were making a production out of it. Right. And so we were going to broadcast it live. And I got the short straw and got sent to go do it, even though I knew nothing about hunting, nothing about moose, no, had no idea why they're doing this. Huh. And he said, um, you know, get the equipment all set up, check it out where they're going to be announcing the names. And, oh, by the way, we've sold so much advertising, we need you to do an hour pregame show. <laughs> and I'm like, what am I going to do for an hour before they start drawing all these names? Well, luckily I walk in and the first person I see is Bud Levitt. Well, he was the uh, hunting and fishing sports columnist for the Bangor Daily News. And he and Ted Williams were big buddies. They used to go hunting and fishing together. Mm -hmm. And some of the Moxie commercials in the Northeast, which Moxie is a soft drink that Ted Williams endorsed, Bud Levitt would be there with him and they'd be bantering or whatever. So that's how I knew him. And I went over and said, Mr. Levitt, I'm from WDME AM and FM up in uh, Dover, Foxcroft, Maine. And we're broadcasting live tonight to Moose Lottery. Could we possibly get you to come talk a little bit about it? He said, why, sure, son, I'd be happy to. Well, I sat him down, asked one question, and he filled the entire hour. And like every 10, 15 minutes, I'd say, Mr. Levitt, that's a really interesting point, but could you hold on one minute? We need to get in a couple of our commercial sponsors. <laughs> and they'd roll him back at the, at, the, uh, at the station. He'd keep right on talking. And then I'd just jump back in when we came back out of the break and say, Mr. Levitt, could you say that last little part again? Our listeners might not have heard it because we were in a commercial break. Yeah. And he filled the whole hour. 
And you're what, 15 years old? I was 17 probably yeah. by then. So but, you were an old hand. You've been oh, thinking yeah. for two years. <laughs> yeah. But um, so I wanted to be a sportscaster. I did, like I said, a lot of that in high school. Uh, I went to the best school in the country for that, which is Syracuse University. Uh, it's the cradle of sportscasters from Marty Glickman to Bob Costas, Marv Albert, Mike Tirico, who was a year ahead of me, and so on down the line. Probably a third of the guys that you see on TV went there. Mm. Uh, you know, and I thought I was in good shape. I'd done a couple of hundred games in my high school career, and I went there and found out I was a very small fish in a very small pond. Yeah compared to those guys and some of them had been doing tv and were very polished uh compared to me and um you know i held my own i did some things but um i wasn't i wasn't going to be on their level i mean mike tarico his junior year was on channel five the cbs affiliate in syracuse doing the new the sports at 11 yeah. o'clock he had it i mean he had it and everybody knew it and I quickly realized that also the athletes were taking over the, all the sportscaster jobs. Mm. You know, there are very few, um, in fact, there's no color commentators now that weren't former athletes. And many of the broadcasters were former athletes as well. And so the professional sportscaster was getting pushed out of the business. And so the handwriting was on the wall. You need to go into news because there's five news jobs for every one sports job mm. and the sports. By and large, the sports people aren't taking those, Michael Strahan being one of the exceptions. Yes. But um, so that's what I did. I went, you know, more towards the news side. At this point, had you looked at art at all? Were you no. interested? Nothing. Had you been to museums even? No. Yeah. No. Um, the only thing relating to what I do now then was when I used to come home from school in the afternoons on the days I wasn't managing uh, a sports team or doing a broadcast – um, there would be three choices. We had, we had three fuzzy channels and public television. And so the Mike Douglas show would be on, a soap opera would be on, and it had the great money movie. I don't even know what that is. Well, it was a local production that was uh, cheesy old movies. And more often than not, it would be a Western. And they would show the secret word of the day some, sometime during the movie. And if you called in, you won 50 bucks. Mm. Now, my mom, who's the ultimate miser, wouldn't let us call in because it was a toll call. <laughs> and that cost 40 cents to call Bangor. So we weren't allowed to do that. But we watched it anyway because it was the best option mm -hmm. out of the three on TV. So I watched a lot of the old cheesy westerns and uh, had an affinity for that. I uh, had an affinity for American history. That was one of my favorite subjects. Money being no object, I'd be a high school history teacher. Mm, that's interesting. And when did you graduate um, from high school? 1985. 85. And so back to uh, Syracuse. Um, so I, I was in their news program, which again is for broadcast is the best in the country. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about it. Um, you know, Northwestern and Georgia and some other places, you know, claim it. But Syracuse has the greatest alumni. Half the people at CNN were Syracuse people mm. at one time. And um, so... That's what I was going to do. Uh, in between my sophomore and my junior junior year, uh, I was running out of money, and I needed to get more money than I'd been making in the summer, which backing up just a little bit. Um, starting when I was about 12 or 13, um, my dad quit his regular job, which was in construction, and started a truck garden, and that's what we did. We grew peas and beans and mm -hmm. potatoes and corn and all these things, and I was the sales manager which meant I had to get up really early in the morning with him and he and mm -hmm. my brother and we'd go pick all the stuff, load up the truck. He'd drive the truck to town with me. We'd set it up. My mom would show up 20 minutes later, pick him up to take him back to the farm, and I'd stay in town the whole day selling the vegetables to people. And one of my customers was Peter and Paula Lunder, who owned Dexter Shoes, and they were shipping the vegetables to their son, who was running a plant in Puerto Rico for them and couldn't get decent vegetables in Puerto Rico and buying for their own selves. Mm -hmm. Fast forward 30 years later, I find out they're one of the top 10 or 15 American art collectors in the world. <laughs> and uh, I wound up borrowing some pieces for them for a show. Did they remember all this when you went back to them? And well, I wrote them a letter when I found this out and I said, I don't know if you remember me, but I was the sto snotty nosed kid on the street corner selling vegetables that you were shipping to Puerto Rico. And now I'm in the art business. So I found out you're big art collectors. What a coincidence this uh -huh. all is. 
And they sent me back the nicest letter and said, uh, we are so proud of Maine people who do important things. Yeah, that's nice. And uh, by the way, our Western art portion of our collection is in our West Palm Beach house because that's the farthest West house we own. Because <laughs> they had a house in Maine, they had a house in Boston and West Palm Beach, Florida. They said, if you're ever down that way, stop by and see us. So, of course, I quickly organized a trip down there and uh, they had the whole floor of a building on the intercoastal water, waterway that was their home in West Palm Beach. And it was just full of Dixons and nice. Morans and blue yeah. chip Taos pieces. Yeah, and, and really great collection, uh, which they eventually gave to Colby College in Waterville, Maine, uh, where she had gone to school. And he may have as well, but I'm, I know she did. And it's a phenomenal collection now. And they gave the money to build a building for it. They've also been very generous. Uh, their name is on the uh, Smithsonian American Art Museum's Conservation Lab. Mm -hmm. It's the Lunder Conservation Center. They also put up some of the money to do the Cal Sharp Foundation archives uh, on Taos. And so they've just been very generous um, to the art world uh, with their profits. Um, you know, when they sold Dexter shoes, they didn't want to be the bad guys to shut down the operations domestically and have to move it overseas. So they sold it to Warren Buffett and let him be the bad guy yeah. through Berkshire Hathaway. And, you know, reportedly they took $300 million in Berkshire Hathaway stock for the company during a period it tripled over the next five years. Mm -hmm. So, so your first art deal was really you were selling vegetables to a great art collector. You just didn't know it at the that's time. That's correct. I just had to wait 30 years to find it out. And so you, you're back in Syracuse now and you're, so between my sophomore and my junior yeah. year, I went in the army and, um, I did what they call one station unit training, which is you do basic training in AIT, which I was an uh, infantryman. And that was in for money? Or was that for to do it for to be help to pay for Syracuse or did you? I, I needed the discipline. Um, I needed to get in shape. Uh, I was heavier then than I am now. Yeah. Um, I, I needed to get the money and I wanted to. Uh, you know, experience something that was bigger than me and, mm -hmm. you know, um, that'll do it. Be part of something. And, you know, the camaraderie is amazing, uh, as difficult as it is. And uh, I was scared as hell when I went in. But uh, I had a friend of mine's dad said, millions of people have been through this. Relatively few fail. Um, they have to make it easy enough for the dumbest guy <laughs> to be able to do it. And it's really about the mind game. And you can handle the mind game part of it. You'll see other people who can't. You may struggle with the physical part, but that's that's the easiest part, actually. Mm -hmm. And that all true, proved to be true. And so, you know, I made it through. Uh, I got back to campus that fall when I was my junior year, and uh, I came out of one of my classes, and there was an Army captain standing there. And he said, are you Private Seth Hopkins? And I said, I'm Seth Hopkins. Mm -hmm. I'm not private today. And he said, well, come with me. And he marched me over to the ROTC office where they sat me down and said, you basically done the first two years of ROTC with what you did last summer. You can come on board now and be equal with the guys that have been doing this for two years. We'll pay you 100 bucks a, a month to take an ROTC class two days a week. And when you go to your National Guard unit, which I was doing the one week in the month, two weeks in the summer deal, uh, you'll be an E5 instead of an E3 which was another hundred bucks a month. Plus you didn't have to pull KP or guard duty. Yeah. And I said, well, where do I sign for that? Cause that was about when my bar tab was running. <laughs> and, um, so my last two years I did ROTC graduated in 89 with a degree in broadcast journalism, having done an internship at a TV station in Watertown, New York for about a year and a half. And I had to go finish my army training. So I'm back to the Benning school for boys as we call Fort Benning, Georgia, mm -hmm. and do officer basic course. And I did a couple of weapons classes just to stay on the dole for a little while longer to build up my nest egg because I knew I wasn't going to make any money when I went in TV, my first job. So I did a mortar platoon leader course. I did a tow missile platoon leader course and, you know, some things like that. And I got a job at a little low power TV station in LaGrange, Georgia. Where's LaGrange? It's just uh, about an hour north of Columbus, which is where Fort Benning is, an hour mm -hmm. south of Atlanta. And it's on the, uh, the route between Atlanta and uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Mm -hmm. 
And it was a very old Southern city, very stratified, uh, very slow moving, um, was a very separate but equal small Southern town or city. Uh, it was, I don't know, 40, 50,000 people maybe, but very, very stratified, very segregated. And uh, was old South. Yeah. Old South. That had to be different coming from Maine. Well, actually it wasn't because there weren't any black people in Maine, period. Yeah. Um, but it was, um, it was different. Uh, but not, not in that way necessarily. Um, you know, in Maine, the French Canadians are discriminated against. Mm. So, you know, everybody has somebody they pick on, but, um, so I'm working at the TV station and it, being in that business, um, was somewhat similar to what I do today in that I was running in circles I didn't belong in. You know, I'm hanging out with the mayor and interviewing the mayor. I'm at the city council meetings. I'm at the, you know, the big uh, fundraisers for the charity. You were a reporter? Is that what yeah, you're doing? Yeah, I was, I was a reporter. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've got my TV camera with me, but I'm getting invited to things that the average person in LaGrange was not getting invited to and had you know, friendships or at least relationships with all the leaders. And, and you're young too. You're like, like 23 or four or something. 22, 23. Yeah. And, um, you know, the camera was a key that let me into that world that the average person in LaGrange didn't have access to. And, and I quickly realized that I could parlay that into getting into things and doing things and going places that, you know, just the average person couldn't do. Um, you know, I could call up any university in the South and say, I need a press pass for this weekend to come cover your football game mm -hmm. because they were the local high school football team was really good. And they had kids on almost every major program in the South. So, you know, I was at um, Florida State game one weekend. Next week, I'm at Clemson. Next week, I'm at LSU. Did you have any kind of feelings like maybe I still really want to do the broadcast of the sporting events at this point? Or had you given that dream up? Uh, no, I was doing some of that, and um, even even my next job, which um, I, I worked that job about a year, and I either quit or got fired. Um, I say I got fired. I quit before I got fired, yeah. but it was pretty damn close, Yeah, <laughs> too close to call. I did some freelance work. I did some photography. I did some writing. I did some radio. I did some television, um, newspaper stringing, um, corporate PR for about – a year and a half and then um you know that was i was making good money doing all that but i didn't have any insurance i didn't know where my next paycheck was coming from i look in the atlanta journal constitution one day and there's an ad for a news director to run a tv radio station combination in cartersville georgia which i had to go look up on the map to see where that was because i didn't know where it was mm -hmm. it was roughly the same distance north of atlanta as lagrange was south and uh, I'll never forget the day that I went to interview was the day that they announced the next Olympics were coming to the city of Atlanta. Yeah. And so that was a big day, you know, for, for Georgia and for Atlanta. And I remember that's the day I went to interview for that job in Cartersville. And I wound up having two interviews with the guy who owned the radio station. And I spoke all of 10 minutes in four hours worth of interviews with this guy. He was a storyteller. He just would tell you stories. And finally, at the end of the second two-hour session, I said, do I have this job or not? He said, hell yeah, you start Monday. My wife will have you married off in six months. <laughs> so she was a junior matchmaker, and uh, she had matched up a lot of people yeah. over the years. And uh, he had rightly assumed she would take care of me. Uh, I wasn't. Married in six months, but I was engaged in six months to somebody she introduced me to. Mm -hmm. uh, and she had introduced the anonymous founders of the Booth Museum earlier. That's one, another one of her that she has to her credit. So I come to Cartersville, um, much more progressive town. Being north of Atlanta, uh, having a lot of new industry. Uh, Budweiser had come in and built a regional brewery there. Shaw Carpets had been there for generations, but was a more progressive company. Um, there were smaller service uh, companies that service these big industries that were run by people from around the world. There were some international companies there. There was twice as much going on in its town half the size. Mm. 
and uh, new ideas were not frowned upon and so on. It was just a very different vibe. It wasn't like LaGrange. Right, right. Yeah. And um, in fact, they came out with a book uh, during that time that I was reporting called The 50 Best Small Towns in America. Uh, the 100 Best Small Towns in America. Cartersville was number 52, mm. I think, if I remember right. And the whole town was pissed. Because they're afraid people were going to come there? Half were pissed for that reason. The other half were pissed they weren't higher on the list. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but um, it's a great, great town. I mean, it just has so much going for it. Uh, you know, the industry uh, makes it not be a bedroom community. Every other community within the distance of Cartersville and inside that are bedroom communities. People go to Atlanta, you know, last person out of town, turn out the lights. Mm -hmm. Cartersville is just not that way because it has such a great manufacturing base and service industry base that it truly has a sense of place. Mm. And the downtown is vibrant. Uh, most small towns in the South, the, the, you know, town square, the downtown area has a lot of boarded up buildings, mm -hmm. empty storefronts. Cartersville's never had that. There, there's people waiting lists for Why downtown is that, property. Do you think? Uh, part of it is that sense of place that people live, work, and play in Cartersville, and they value the history of it. They value the the sense of place that it has, and the blue collar nature of the town still um, having that feel. And that people, you know, don't leave to go out of town. Uh, all that builds on on having that vibrant downtown. They have a, they feel like they have a history and embrace it. And the people who own the downtown property have been very diligent about not leasing those properties to doctors' offices, lawyers' offices, governmental offices. They want retail in those spaces. They've taken a responsibility. They have, and restaurants and retail shops. So that, you know, it's not just a bunch of offices down there. There's the thriving, you know, businesses mm -hmm. of people coming and going. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're continuing to try to tweak that. Uh, Rome, which is a city two and a half times the size of Cartersville, about 30 minutes away, they have a much more vibrant kind of live music, you know, uh, in the evenings, um, restaurant, bar mm -hmm. scene. They also have three colleges. We only have one in Cartersville, but it's because the alcohol laws have been loosened up and Cartersville's just now doing that. And mm. I think that's going to have a big effect. But anyway, that's an aside. So I worked uh, two years doing TV radio news there. Um, so it's no, like 88, 89 kind of time frame? Yeah, uh, 91, 92, okay. 93. Okay. Um, um, and when I first went there, I was 23, 24, supervising four people in their 30s and 40s. So that was an interesting situation to walk into. But um, so I did that. And uh, one day they came and they said, uh, they want you over at the corporate office. Well, the guy who owned the radio station acted like he owned this whole deal that I was working for. And it was really half owned by the cable company, which was owned by the anonymous gentleman who eventually founds the Booth Museum. But he didn't want anybody to know he owned anything. So mm -hmm. the guy who owned the radio station, who acted like he owned everything, they were great partners because he would be the front guy and, you know, my guy would be in the shadows and right. happy as, as a lark. So I said, what corporate office? They said, the corporate office of the cable company. I said, what cable company? They said, the one you've been working for for two years. I mean, it wasn't quite that, All right. you know, but close to it. So I go over there and they interview me for a job to be the uh, public affairs person, uh, which is slightly different than public relations person, because this included doing governmental affairs, uh, franchising, which was negotiating the contracts with the local governments. Cable TV is a local government by local government regulated industry, not state or federal, although federal has some oversight but it's very much a local thing or it was at least in those days and uh, the congress had just overridden bush 41 to regulate cable tv rates it's the only veto override in his four years as president and the cable industry realized they had screwed up and not done a good job with their pr and their customer service and that's why they got hammered so bad so people like me were getting hired at companies all over and kind of trying to fix the reputation of cable companies. And so that's what I did for more or less five or six years at the corporate office. 
And at the corporate office were hanging a lot of Western paintings and a lot of movie posters and posters for Westerns and so on. And, you know, it was cool decoration. We didn't know some of this stuff was important. Mm -hmm. But um, you noticed it. I noticed it. Uh, in fact, the, um, in my office when I first went to work there was a painting by Harold Hopkinson. Mm -hmm. And I never knew whether that was a coincidence or whether it was intentional that Hopkins' son was hung in my office. Uh, I have since bought pieces by both Harold and, Ger and Gerald Hopkinson, uh, who were reasonably well-known Western artists, not very well-known, uh, for my personal collection, just because I thought that was a cool tie-in. Mm -hmm. But um, And that's what art is sometimes, right? I mean, yeah, it absolutely, is. absolutely. You never know what's going to trigger yeah. um, your, your interest or your love of a piece, for sure. Um, so I did that, like I say, five, six, seven years. Uh, I was often a person they would come to with a special project and say, um, you know, we're thinking about this new business or we're thinking about this um, way to improve customer service. Or I remember one of the projects I worked on was uh, the first satellite um, dispatch trucks hmm. where the dispatcher could see where all the trucks were at any given time and the satellite and the GPS system would route the trucks in the most efficient way so that, you know, a guy didn't get in a truck with a notebook full of orders and just go in whatever order he wanted to. You know, he was had a prescribed route and, and somebody's watching him the whole time. And, you know, so they sent me, even though I was not a technical person within the company, to go investigate this. And I think partially it was because I can understand enough of the technology to get by. But more importantly, I could see the big picture and I could bring it back to them and describe it to them in a way that made the technology understandable and how it was going to make us money or save us money or hopefully both. And so that may have given them some of the confidence for what's to come. The last thing I did was uh, we were putting local TV stations on the air in all of our markets. Mm -hmm. And so what I had been running in Cartersville, the TV radio station there, we were starting to put those in communities where we didn't have them. Uh, we had had three of those, and I built three more over the next two-year period. And that was between 98, 99, heading into 2000. So at that point, I had six TV stations I was responsible for, about 100 employees. Their average age was 23, hmm. 24. Really? Yeah. And you're not that old either, mid-30s. At that point, I'm uh, 32, yeah. 31, 32. And, um, you know, so dealing with 124-year-olds, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. it's much harder today, I'm sure, but it was hard enough then. And um, so we're leading up to Y2K. This was 99. The satellite dishes are starting to uh, penetrate the cable business. There's starting to be real competition. Looks like the phone companies are going to be getting into that. Looks like we as the cable industry are going to be getting into the phone business and the internet business. And, you know, it's going to become a much more complicated environment. And our founder of the cable company, who will be the founder of the art museum, went on a round the world cruise with his wife. And they were gone like eight months. And he walked in a meeting the first week he was back. And people were throwing in acronyms around and, and things that he didn't understand. It had changed that much that quickly. And his daughter, who was running the company, was uh, getting ready to have kids. And so he walked in my office. This was my Y2K moment right at the end of 99. And he said, we're selling the cable company. I'm going to build an art museum, put my collection in it, and you're going to run it. <laughs> That's an oh, my God moment. And so when... And what uh, the hell did you think? Well, when I regained consciousness, yeah. got my jaw back in place... Um, I said, uh, I don't know anything about art and I don't know if I can spell museum. <laughs> and, uh, he said, well, you know, you didn't know anything about cable TV 10 years ago. You know, you became an expert at that. Uh, you'll learn this a lot quicker and, uh, get out there and learn something about it. So you clearly had a good relationship with this individual well, and they, he trusted you to, yeah, to take this, I think love, it must've been a love for them. To yes. Do yes. Um, a lot of it was trust. And in hindsight, um, he later told me that they had gone to see a couple of headhunters and that they had talked to them about helping them find a museum director for this project. 
and what they were seeing in the skill inventory that the headhunters were using to evaluate potential candidates, to them, it was 70, 80% business, 20, 30% art history, whatever. And, you know, after hearing that a couple of times and the fact they wanted a hundred grand to go find somebody, right. they said, well, shoot, we got business people at home that can learn something about art, you know? And they did the same with the foundation that they created. Um, one of my counterparts at the cable company who worked in another part of the business became the director of the foundation, which built the museums and still underwrites part of the operating cost today, came from that executive mm -hmm. ranks as well. And we wound up transferring a lot of people from the corporate office into our museum business and philanthropic endeavors because they had the skills, they had the attitude, they just didn't have the experience. And so, you know, he's always been a big one to say, you hire for attitude, you train for aptitude. Mm. And somebody who's passionate, um, somebody who's loyal, and somebody who cares about what they're doing can be taught to do almost anything. And he's believed that I've, ever since or all along. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of joke around the office and say, you know, you did such a good job mowing our lawn, why don't you do our taxes? <laughs> and that literally happened in some cases. Guys that started out mowing the lawn, went to school, yeah. were given internships while they were in school and wound up running our accounting department. Yeah, if they're motivated, they have goals, you can do that. And, you know, when I was uh, running the TV station side, I said, give me somebody with passion and curiosity mm. and I can teach them to do the rest. If they don't have passion and curiosity, they're never going to be a good reporter. And that's true of a lot of, a lot of careers. Mm -hmm. Um I, I, it just baffles me, people who are not curious. Yeah, I don't, well, I'm doing a podcast, so clearly, <laughs> you know, I, I'm on your side of this. And when they did this, so he offers you this job, did they have any idea how big a museum it was going to be, or was it still just a nebulous idea? Well, uh, they've been working on it behind the scenes. Um, apparently during this round the world cruise, they had talked about selling the company and you know doing some things philanthropically, which they created a major, major foundation, private operating foundation that was going to do things in every community where they had done business. Mm. So in other states where we had had cable systems, uh, people were hired and or people went from Cartersville to those areas to find out what the needs in those communities were and money was, money was funneled to those needs. Uh, in one instance, we built a human services building to house all the human service agencies in that community in one building. So it could be a one-stop shop for people who needed help. That was one of the projects we did elsewhere. But in Cartersville, the original plan was that museum was going to be 30, 35,000 square feet. And it wasn't going to own anything it couldn't show. And it was going to have a minimal staff with minimal programs. By the time we got an open, uh, three years later, for me coming on, uh, it was, was 80,000 square feet originally. It was expanded five years later to 120,000 square feet with you know major storage areas, major programming spaces, a pretty aggressive uh, temporary exhibition program, uh, major programming in terms of lectures and artist appearances and things. And how did that evolve from such a small thing to a big... I mean, was that a, just an organic thing, or is that you're learning, you're seeing what other museums do, and you go, we can be bigger, we can do more? Well, uh, I was certainly in the middle of it, um, but we had a design team. Uh, people always say, who is your architect? And I flippantly say we didn't have one, which we really didn't for the first year of the project, almost. Um, the founder did not want an architect-driven building. He didn't want something like the Denver Art Museum or the Guggenheim or Bilbao, Spain, or, right. you know, you name it, the building that is impractical as a museum. He wanted a, a very simple, welcoming, um, you know, it, monolithic um, building that was very, very functional. Mm -hmm. And he kept saying functional, functional, functional. If it winds up looking nice, that's okay too. Um, so we hired a designer who had done some work on a house for him in Santa Fe, him and his wife, and had done some hotel 
uh, decorating in Santa Fe and so on. But, you know, really, this was a pretty darn big project to be given him. But again, it goes right along with everything else. Mm -hmm. You know, you hire people with vision and passion and curiosity and, you know, let them loose and good things may result. And, you know, nine, that's a beautiful building. Nine out of 10 times it's worked for him. Um, so he and um, we eventually did hire a local architect to turn his designs into buildable blueprints and to have a uh, certified uh, architect sign off on it. Um, but between him, the designer, the staff, and our, our small board, which was essentially the founder's family, we fanned out and probably visited 200 facilities and made notes on things that were right and wrong with buildings. And to your point on the program and the exhibitions, I'll never forget we went to the uh, Norton, R.W. Norton Museum in Shreveport, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal collection. Very nice building. Nobody in the place. Mm. Five security guards and somebody at the front desk. No sign of any temporary exhibitions, no sign of any programming, no sign of anything going on other than this building full of art with nobody in it. Mm. And when you did go in there, the five security guards were so happy to have somebody in there to watch that all five of them were watching you. <laughs> and it was a very unsettling situation. I don't mean to pick on them, and they have done a few things over the years with some temporary exhibits and things, but, you know, we... We and I particularly decided at that moment, we want to be a place where things happen, not just a place where things hang on the wall. And Part of the community. Well, and particularly in our part of the world where Western art is not ubiquitous and um, collectors, there are a lot of collectors, but they're few and far between out of 5 million people in Atlanta. And uh, we want to be the Mecca for those people who love that stuff, uh, love the West, and want to get their fix without having to get on a plane. And we want to be the meeting nexus center for those folks and bring new ones to the fold that through our programming and exhibitions and, and the permanent collection and, and the staff and the welcoming environment we wanted to create, that we could make it a viable part of the North Georgia community rather than you know just being a mausoleum with a collection in it. Mm-hmm. And that was tremendously important to me. And, you know, uh, the board was on board to let me go in that direction. When you went around to these museums, did you find that, first of all, did they know what you were doing? And were they? It's a very collegial field. It was. Okay. They said, yes, let's help you. This. I mean, I. I, I wonder. I mean, yeah, I wonder I, if they would go, hey, we don't want you trupping on our Western art area. That's what we do. No, because uh, I think the biggest part of that is we were so ge a lot geographically removed from anybody else's territory they worried, that they weren't worried. And even if they were, uh, I cannot remember a time where we called a museum and said, we'd like to come see your facility and talk about it, or we'd like to send one of our employees to shadow one of your employees to see what they do and mm -hmm. learn some things. Or would you help us develop this policy or this plan, or would you share your policies and plans with us that we you know might use them i cannot think of an instance where i ever was turned down on wow, any of those kind of impressive. things um you think it's because you're you're going to western museums primarily um in those days we weren't necessarily going just to western museums because we we're looking at facilities overall and it didn't matter if they're western or not um, and in fact they would have been more likely to help because we weren't going to be on their turf mm. than the western museums would have but Again, I, I can't remember anybody who ever turned us down from a legitimate request. Had you gotten back and gotten your master's at this point yet? I was starting to work on it. Um, I had looked into my options, and uh, I first probably 2001, which we, we would have been, you know, putting the, the cell, the basement in the ground and starting to come out of the ground with the, uh, the building because we broke ground in October of 2000. Mm -hmm. And um, in 2001, I was starting to try to figure out what I was going to do academically to have some chops to, you know, be on some kind of footing with my peers and, you know, have some base of academic knowledge in the subject area. I mean, that had to be a hell of a thing to try to come on and run this museum and you're going to get a lot of feedback negative feedback like why you and you don't have any yeah. training and all that 
Well, uh, Fritz Shoulder was the one who gave me the hardest time about that. Uh, I was on the phone talking with him, and uh, he quickly realized I didn't know very much about art and ripped me up one side down the other. And, uh, you know, that helped motivate me a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that I didn't know an aqua tint from a mezzo tint from a um, serograph. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some ways, I still don't, but that's another story. <laughs> um, the it, it was pretty chaotic. Um, you know, we're building a physical museum. We're um, evaluating the founder's collection and figuring out how we're going to show it. Mm -hmm. uh, we we're acquiring work at a pretty rapid pace to supplement that collection because we knew it wasn't enough to fill the space that was going to be provided. Looking at temporary shows we might want to bring in at some point, building a staff, building a building, building a programming and exhibition program. And, you know, my kids were probably, let's see, they would have been six and four and six, mm. five and seven uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. Um so I went to uh, I went to Georgia State, downtown Atlanta. It was the closest school that had a um, master's degree in art history. And I said, you know, hey, I, I want to enroll in your master's in art history program. And I said, okay, let's see your transcript. And they <laughs> laughed me right out of the building. I, they said, you never even took art appreciation, let alone art history 101. And I said, so? Yeah. I said, I need a master's in art history. I'm running this art museum. And they looked at me like, what? <laughs> How did you get that job without having ever taken an art history class? <laughs> right. I said, well, that's another story for another day, but I need to be in this program. And they said, well, you can't come in our program. The discussion would not be at the appropriate level. Hmm. They said, you need to go take a year's worth of upper level undergraduate art history and then come back. I said, okay. So I went to Kennesaw State, which is about halfway between Cartersville and Atlanta, much closer, easier to get to. And that's what I did. I took a year's worth of upper level undergraduate art history. Uh, I did one, one class of that was a um, self-directed study on the art of Harry Jackson. Mm. Uh, and another was uh, a class on Western history, not art history, but the history of the West. Now, I had, an, I had a minor in American history from Syracuse. Fine Eastern Year, fine Eastern American University. I didn't know one thing that happened west of the Mississippi River. Mm. You know, West American history was taught in those Eastern universities, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, yeah. DC. Yeah, there's some hinterlands out there and there's stuff going on, but you know, the real history but is they're here. not really important. <laughs> right. And um, you know, I, I read um Undaunted Courage, the yeah. study of Lewis and Clark. And um, I thought it was the old Saturday morning cartoon. You know, uh, Meriwether Lewis is in the front of the <laughs> canoe. Sacagawea is standing up in the middle. Right. And Clark's in the back steering. And there's just the three of them. I didn't know it was 50 guys and 10 boats and <laughs> tons of supplies. Right. And order years. pages of orders from Jefferson about what they should be doing. Yeah. And, you know, a military operation. So, you know, I say you don't know. You don't know how much you don't know about something until you know a little bit about it. At, one, at, at any point, did you go, oh, my God, I'm, this is over my head. I've got so much to learn and run a museum and do all the other stuff? Um, I think I was so busy I didn't have time to have those thoughts. Yeah. Uh, the one that did get me, though, was I wasn't very far into it. I mean, we had opened the museum, but I was still relatively new when uh, the cowboy artist called and wanted to know if I would judge the CA show. Yeah. And... Um, I was like, I, 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 yeah, no, I don't know I about see that. Um, you know, I, to this day, I, just, I still don't think of myself as an art guy. You know, I, I didn't come up through it. I, I don't have any talent. I, I don't make art. Um, you know, I'm scared to death when I judge a show that I'm going to pick a piece that has an obvious flaw in it mm -hmm. that somehow I didn't see. And somebody's going to go, how can you pick that piece? Look mm -hmm. at that. But, um, so I called my mentor, Byron Price, um, who we'll probably get back to talking about in a minute. But uh, he said, well, who judged last year? And I told him who the three guys were. And he said, who judged the year before? And I told him, he said, you've looked at more art in the last four years than those six guys put together. Yeah. Trust your eye, trust your gut, go do it. And it was a great experience. I was with Ken Schuster from the uh, Brenton Museum in Sheridan, Wyoming. 
and Kurt Walters, the great landscape painter right. and dean of Grand Canyon painters. And had a great time. And, uh, you know, we jihad and bantered and eventually came up with our, our slate of winners. And Kurt sent me the nicest note. Now, I might have been blowing smoke out my skirt, but he wrote me a note that said, I learned so much that day judging with you and Ken. Well, and you can also come at a different angle than they can. You see things differently than maybe somebody who has all the burdens of looking at art in a certain fashion. I think that's an advantage in a weird way. Well, one of the things I catch myself doing when I'm judging shows and, and looking at art is uh, it's got to make sense to me. Mm. And a lot of things, they don't make sense. Uh, I was at the Briscoe last weekend, and I'm not going to say the artist, but you know, there's a, a romantic teepee scene that you've seen a hundred times, but there's about a 30 degree slope and the teepee set in the slope. <laughs> yeah. That's not going to happen. No. I mean, you roll right out of it. Yeah. <laughs> there's no way it would stay there. And if it rained, it would slide right off into the river. Yeah. Well, I can't get past that. Yeah. You know, it might've been well painted. It might've been a great composition. It might've been an right. interesting story, but you don't pitch a teepee. Do your homework if you're an artist and you're going to do historical kind of paintings. You know, have it make sense. Yeah. Um, yet, one of my favorite paintings in the world is Emigrants Crossing the Plains by Albert Bierstadt. Mm -hmm. That's at the National Cowboy Museum in Oklahoma City. And it's a wagon train headed west. And it's about to be sunset in about three minutes. <laughs> and they have not set up camp. Yeah. Now, if you're a wagon train... How long before sunset are you going to set up camp? Yeah, you need to tell At me. least an hour, right? But I can get past that because it's so damn good and so romantic and so well done and the emotional quality of it is so great mm -hmm. that I can I can look past that. This other one, it, it didn't have that kind of drama. It's not a national story, right? you know, incarnate or in paint. And, um, you know, it, it just wasn't working. So you take these courses in this college to get ready to try to do a master's and what where did you go from there so i i get my tickets punched at kennesaw and go back to georgia state say okay i did what you told me to do can i come in the program they said yes you can come on in so the first class i take at georgia state is the history of american art history which i had just taken at kennesaw as an undergraduate but this is going to be at the graduate level mm -hmm. So I walk in the first day of class, there's 40 kids in the room. And I go, what the heck? I thought graduate classes were supposed to be much smaller. Mm -hmm. Teacher comes in and says, um, all right, how many undergraduates do I have? 36 hands go up. How many grad students do I have? Four. It's a cross-listed class. 3,000 and 5,000 level class. So she says, all right, graduate students, I'm going to be meeting with you one Friday every other week to have a graduate seminar discussion of the material we're going to cover with the undergraduates during our normal class times, and your papers have to be twice as long. So this is an example of the discussion being at the appropriate level that I couldn't come in before <laughs> I went and did these other classes, right? Yeah. So I, so I, I grin and bear it, finish that class, go see my faculty advisor, and she says, well, the American history professor who taught most of the American art history classes died last year, and we're not going to replace him. Mm. And they had this, um, the lady I had taken the uh, art, American art history class from was a um, adjunct faculty, and she was fantastic. But she didn't have a PhD, so they wouldn't give her a you know, full-time job. And I said, okay, I know I'm not going to get any Western art here. I mean, I, I know that's way too much to ask, but I at least want to study American art and the European art that it derives from. And I said, well, we're, we're kind of moving away from that. <laughs> uh, we're going to be doing everything but that. Because if you want that, you need to go over to Emory across town because mm -hmm. they're really the school for that. Well, the problem for me with Emory was they don't give master's degrees. It's only terminal degree program. So I could have done the coursework, the equivalent of a master's, but I wouldn't have gotten the actual degree because they want everybody getting a PhD because they're a professor school. Yeah. They're, they're creating professors is what they're doing. And it was a fully funded program, which meant cost $35,000 a year to do the program, but they would pay you $35,000 to TA. 
So like your first year, you would TA Art History 101. Second year, you'd TA an upper level class. And third year, you'd be teaching 101. And you'd be done with the program and, and not owe any money, which is great. But I didn't have time to be taking classes, let alone teaching classes. Yeah, you're working as it all along. Yeah, the way. we're building a museum, we're right. building a collection, we're researching the collection, we're, you know, doing all this stuff. And so uh, I went and took a couple of classes through West Georgia University, which they had a, a public history museum studies program. Mm -hmm. So I studied museum programming, museum collections management, things like that. That was just going to lead to a certificate, graduate level, which wasn't going to be that valuable. I went out to Cody one summer uh, and took a, a whole, uh, it was a semester's worth of Western American art history taught by Peter Hasrick. Oh, that the, must have been fun. The greatest scholar in our, our world. Yeah. And um, that was worth three credits. And then he was teaching that every afternoon for two weeks. In the morning, they were teaching a class called The Politics and Poetics of Powwows. Hmm. Like, how are they going to fill two weeks worth of material on powwows? Well, I signed up for the class because I could get three graduate credits and quickly found out they just scratched the surface of that topic in two weeks. So I got six graduate credits that way. I had the one I had taken at Georgia State. I had the six I have from West Georgia, but it wasn't going to lead to anything. So finally, Byron Price, who had run the National Cowboy Museum for 10 years, had run the Buffalo Bill Historical Center for five or six years, had then come to the University of Oklahoma to take over the Charles M. Russell Center for the Study of Western Art at mm -hmm. University of Oklahoma, which Peter Hasrick had started, and Byron came to run. And we had hired Byron as a consultant for the museum to help us sort out the collection and how to present it and what were the themes and how to do research and so on. So he had worked for me one weekend a month for two years. He'd get on a plane on Friday afternoon, come to Cartersville, spend Saturday and Sunday with me, some of the other staff sometimes, sometimes with the founders, and work on these issues. So towards the end of that, he said, well, how are you coming with your academics? Over dinner one night, and I'm giving him this whole tale of woe that we've just covered. And he said, well, you need to come study with me at OU. And I said, I don't have time to be running out to <laughs> Norman, Oklahoma. I, you know, I got all these right. things going on. He goes, no, 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 we'll do the whole thing on the internet. And so he hooked me up with the, the uh, College of Liberal Studies, and we basically cobbled together a master's level program with courses that they created with the director of the art museum, the Fred Jones Art Museum, which is a really great art museum. It is, yeah. I mean, outside New England, where every school has a great art museum, they're one of the best in the country. Um, they had just built or were building the Sam Noble Natural History Museum, which is an incredible mm -hmm. facility there on campus. So those two directors each created a class for me. Byron created some reading material in classes. I did some more independent mm -hmm. study things. Uh, and basically we cobbled together this thing and they got somebody in academia to sign off on that's a reasonable course load. Yes, that's the equivalent of a master's program that's already in place. Some of that would become what is now the PhD program at the University of Oklahoma which is the only PhD in the world in Western American mm -hmm. art. And to my knowledge, there's still only one graduate from that program, a uh, lady from Nebraska. Uh, several people who have worked towards it, but nobody else, I think, has mm -hmm. you know, gone the full nine miles. I didn't know if Tricia Losher did that or not. Um, I believe she has her PhD in American art history, mm. uh, like Mindy Besaw does and like Amy Scott does, mm. and, or American studies even. Um, but not in Western American art history. Um, only University of Oklahoma has that program. And uh, it's very rigorous because they're under such scrutiny, being the only one, and the university wanting to make sure that it cuts the mustard and you know is equally rigorous as other graduate programs. And so they go overboard to make it yeah, really rigorous. tough. <laughs> uh, that's kind of academia. But... Um, so eventually then we get around to, okay, what am I going to do my master's thesis on? And so Byron and I had four or five topics we were mm -hmm. kicking around. And uh, um, um, Jim Ballinger, who was the uh, director then at the Phoenix Art Museum where the Cowboy Art Show of America was, and, and I knew him through that, I'd asked him to come speak at the museum about the history of the CA and their relationship with the Phoenix Art Museum and so on for one of our lunchtime speaker series. 
And again, over dinner, he says, well, you know, what are you doing academically? And I told him, and, and I said, it's time to pick my thesis. And he goes, well, what are you thinking about? And I said, well, Byron, I've got four or five topics. And one of them is Warhol in the West. And he just stopped me dead right there and said, if you don't do that, you're an idiot. <laughs> I don't even want to hear what the other possible topics yeah. are. Jim's pretty bright. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, you know, I'm interested in that. And we have um, a, a big part of his Western over in our collection, which seems to be such an anomaly to me. The 87 series. Right. Yeah. Uh, Cowboys and Indians. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, you know, I'm interested in finding out how, why, how and why is that here? How does it fit in with contemporary Western mm -hmm. art? How does it fit into Warhol's over? And he said, well, that's my point is that that is a topic that has so much more applicability beyond just the Western ghetto, the Western art box that, academically uh, that's going to give you chops beyond just the western art world and it's going to you know it's something that needs to be investigated needs to be done needs to be written and then from a personal standpoint it's going to put you you know out there with more chops than you would if you had done it on frank tenney johnson right. or frederick remington right. or charlie russell or you know name a western artist you know, Andy Warhol is the most recognized name in art in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And um, most people don't know he did anything Western. And so to have that be the, you know, thing that you focus on, he said, that's going to put you in good stead. And so I didn't want to be an idiot. <laughs> so that's <laughs> what I did. Ballinger tells you you will be. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's what I wound up doing. And what did uh, you learn from that? Well, um, so the, the thesis uh, statement was Andy Warhol in 1986-87, right before he dies, last major project he does is a series of 14 Cowboys and Indians images, 10 of which are, are issued as an edition print portfolio, four others that they experimented with but did not produce uh, edition prints of, except for one, which is an anomaly, but we don't have time for all that. You have to read the book. Okay. But... Um, where does that come from? Is that somewhere, something that comes out of nowhere? Is it somebody else's idea? Is it his idea? And is it the culmination of a lifelong interest in the West and exposure to the West, or is it just something that spontaneously combusts? Well, if it was the latter, it'd be about a three-page paper. Mm -hmm. Luckily, it's the former, and it's a 110-page paper, soon to be a 144-page book that's going to accompany the exhibition when we open it in August this year. Mm. So What's the title of that? Uh, Warhol in the West. Oh, nice. Oh, very cool. Warhol in the West. And University of California Press is publishing the book. Uh, and the university, I mean the... Uh, this is your book. Well, sort of. Uh, the Art Museum, the Tacoma Art Museum, is the lead institution on the book. And so it'll have all three of the museums that the show's going to on it. Uh, probably a third of the book is my original thesis blended and chopped up to fit mm -hmm. the content of the book. Uh, but we brought in the curator from Tacoma, Faith Brower, and Michael Brower, who's the curator at the National mm -hmm. Cowboy Museum, who came late to the project, but is kind of the, the third curator on the project. Um, we wrote a lot of the stuff that's in it, but the Tacoma went out and got another 15 or 20 contributors to write on specific pieces from different vantage points, hmm. particularly Native Americans, writing about the Native American images that he... Um, right, the Geronimo and... The, that he uh, appropriated yes. is the uh, art word, which means stole, yeah. um, for his purposes. And so, you know, there's, uh, there's a, a few places in the book where they line Andy up against the wall and shoot him for appropriating Indian images. Yeah. Like he's the only person who ever did it, but still not kosher. And, um, but a lot of the book deals with his, um, and the show deals with his interest in the West, his love of the West from when he was a kid. You know, he grew up in the thirties. Mm -hmm. Every kid who grew up in the thirties went Rogers Saturday morning and saw Roy Rogers and Gene Autry. Yeah. Now he also was interested in the leading men and the leading women of the day and kept a photo, um, scrapbook of publicity photos and things from movies that had dashing heroes and elegant ladies. But Roy Rogers and Gene Autry were in there too. Mm -hmm. um, 
he he loved the West. He spent a lot of time in Colorado. He owned property in Colorado. He loved Taos, New Mexico. Uh, he and Dennis Hopper owned an Indian artifact store in Taos for a very short period mm -hmm. of time. He loved to go drinking with R.C. Gorman. Um, he was friends with Fritz Scholder. He was friends with George O'Keefe, did her portrait. He mm -hmm. did uh, Dennis Hopper as a Western movie star. He did Clint Eastwood as a Western movie star. Um, he collected a lot of Navajo Rex weavings as well. Absolutely. And I've jewelry had. and pots mm -hmm. and yeah. on and on and on. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. But if you can think back to one of his very first successful images was Elvis. Yes. And that was as a cowboy. And what was Elvis doing? He had his gun out. So I make the point uh, in the book and in the in the paper that, you know, the critics who studied Warhol said Warhol was the mirror to America. Mm. He held up a mirror and said, America, this is who you are. So if he had done Elvis as a teenage singing sensation, that would have been Americana. If he had done Elvis as a teenage singing sensation, become matinee movie idol, double Americana. Elvis as a teen singing sensation, become matinee movie idol, Western movie star, triple Americana. And he does triple Elvis. Mm hmm that's America. Yeah. Guy from Mississippi that can sing the blues and rock and roll. Right. Um, you know, get women to throw their room keys and panties on the stage and uh, turn that into a movie career when he couldn't act and then turn that into being a Western movie star when he didn't know anything about the West and couldn't ride a horse. Mm -hmm. God bless America. Mm -hmm. That's who you are. Um, so he has all these things, you know, Western. And the most interesting of all, though, is in 1976, an artist who claimed to have no interest in social commentary, no political acts to grind, disavowed any political leanings, asked somebody, who's the most radical Native American mm -hmm. in, in America today? And the answer comes back to him, Russell Means. Yeah who was a member of AIM, the American Indian Movement. Mm -hmm. He wasn't necessarily the leader, per se, but he was one of the he leading the, people. Yeah, he was the figurehead. And the, this is the group who had read through some of the American treaties that had been broken with the Indians over the years and found several that said if there was any unused federal land anywhere, the Indians were welcome to go live on it. Well, that happened to include Alcatraz Island. Yep. So they occupied Alcatraz and turned it into a, a native reservation. Uh, they went to the site of Wounded Knee, the yep. famous massacre, and they had a, a live-in, sit-in there, uh, caused a stalemate with the authorities and so on. And he was right in the middle of all these things. So here we are in 1976. We're celebrating our 200 years of our greatness. Mm -hmm. And Andy Warhol is making pictures of Russell Means. Hmm. No political commentary, no <laughs> political leanings, no social awareness. I think not. Mm -hmm. uh, ironically, that same year, Fritz Scholder does a um, uh, serograph type print uh, called American Landscape, 1876, 1976. And it's where he appropriated Edgar Paxson's painting of Custer's Last Stand that hangs in the Buffalo Bill Museum in Cody. And produces it as a very stark three-color print, red, white, and blue. Every figure in the painting is red, blood red. The sky is just dark, dark blue. And Custer is the saintly martyr in white in the middle of the picture. Mm. It's a very striking image. And near as I can figure, Shoulder did that image at the same time or before Warhol's doing his Russell Means series, and they didn't know each other. So whether one inspired the other or not, I can't say. But, but didn't Warhol do an image of shoulder? He did, I think. Later. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But they were aware of each other at that point. And so here's, you know, two guys making this art saying, all right, let's slow the roll on the bicentennial, how great we are 200 years old as a country. And let's think for a minute what we did in steamrolling the Indians. Mm hmm and, um, you know, that was not a popular thing at that time. And that was 1876, by the way, for Custer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and even, um, you know, 
So it was 100 I, years since when, then. When I'm filling up that graduate paper, I'm looking for any little straws or threads I can pull to say, you know, hey, maybe Andy was interested in this. At one point, Andy said he wanted to change his name. You know, his original name was Warhola. That's mm -hmm. the family name. He dropped right. the A to make it Warhol to sound more American instead of European. He said he thought about changing his name to Andy Morningstar. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. And Custer was known as the, the the son of the Morning Star by the Indians. Now, whether he ran across that or not, there was a book, Marjorie Morning Star, but that came later after he said this. So nobody knows for sure, but uh, Kent Kleiman, who's the one who eventually is the publisher of the uh, Cowboys and Indians suite, uh, said that Andy was a Custer nut, that he loved Custer. Hmm. So... Maybe it comes from there. Maybe it doesn't. But these are the kind of little la rabbit trails I follow. Yeah, that's very interesting. Throughout the throughout the paper, but enough about Warhol. Yeah, that's very interesting though. And so that's coming up at the booth. It opens August twenty fifth at the booth. It'll be there through the holidays. It then travels to the National Cowboy Museum in Oklahoma City, which I'll be speaking there at the Prix de West this year about that exhibition. And that's in June of that's this in June. Year. And my my. my uh, this year I'll be speaking about oh, it, but they'll be okay. getting it the next winter. So it'll be six months out or so. Uh, my topic, my title for that talk is, I hope the National Cowboy Museum's lightning insurance is paid up because Andy Warhol is coming to be exhibited at the hall. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, But it will only be his Indian series? No, it'll be... We couldn't get an Elvis because those are cost prohibitive. It's super and expensive. They, and they don't travel. Um, but there'll be a, an installation photograph of that exhibition that you'll walk into. That'll be the first thing you'll mm -hmm. see. And then it will go roughly in timeline order of his interest in the West. His two Western movies that he produced, one of which filmed right here at Old Tucson mm -hmm. called Lonesome Cowboys, which is a forerunner to Brokeback Mountain. Mm. Uh, another one he did called Horse. Uh, there'll be a screen test, uh, which were little three-minute videos he did of, of people who came to his studio, Dennis Hopper. There'll be pictures of George O'Keefe, R.C. Gorman, Fred Shoulder that he did, uh, Dennis Hopper, uh, Sunset series that he did. Doesn't get any more Western than a sunset, right? Yeah. Um, there'll be a lot of his artifacts. Um, at the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, they have 27 pairs of cowboy boots that he wore. Mm -hmm. Every interviewer just about describes him when they describe what he was wearing when they came to interview him wearing cowboy boots. Mm. Half the boots are pristine, would have been the ones he wore out to Studio 54. The other half got paint all over them. Those are the ones he would have been wearing in the studio when he was mm. painting. So uh, all these little things are going to add up to the Cowboys and Indians suite. So at our place, at least, the installation will be one big room full of all the other stuff that he did Western and some description of his process. How did he do these silk screens? And what was the print proofing process of picking the color combinations for the ones they were going to print 250 of? Mm. They would do 36 trial proofs of each subject they thought they might produce. And then they would look at all 36 and decide which one would sell the best, mm. not what's the most artistic, mm -hmm. which one's going to sell the best. Color wise. Right. And so we will have all of those in a separate room. So you'll go through this whole thing and find out about all these things in his life that were his Western influences, his Western travels, his Western collections. And then you'll go into another room where it would be the suite that's the culminating um, cherry on the top of all the things Western he ever did. And it's the last big thing he did before he died. Yeah, very last. Yeah. So that's kind of a the way to uh, unfold. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Now, with regards to... And you know, we kind of jumped ahead with the Warhol, but you know, you get your masters, right? You get the museum going. You're starting yep. to buy art. Yep. I remember when you guys came onto the scene um, with a splash, actually, and I think the splash was, "Hey, who's this art museum that's actually spending money, not only with artists but actually art galleries?" Uh, and I seemed like to me that was extremely smart uh, thinking to get the galleries in your corner yeah we actually didn't spend any money with artists yeah i mean we the the founders had built their collection buying through galleries and supporting the gallery owners who helped educate them in the early days who were 
um, their conduit to the artists and who turn them on to new artists or artists they weren't aware of and help them, you know, mm-hmm. hone their eye to pick the best pieces by the artists they wanted to collect. And so when we started the museum, it was just natural that a, we were going to continue to collect living artists, which is what they had been doing, which has still been your focus pretty much. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, when, when the money went out of their private pockets and into the foundation's pockets and was then OPM, other people's money, not their money because they mm-hmm. couldn't get it back. Right. You know, once you put it in the foundation, it's yep. in the foundation. But now they started spending it like it was other people's money. So they were buying his, some historic pieces that were several th- hundred thousand dollars that they never would have justified buying for themselves. Right. Like a big Maynard Dixon. Exactly. Exactly. Or a Warren Rollins or a W.R. Lee mm-hmm. or a Hennings or a William right. Penhall Henderson, you know, which we've got a dozen major deceased pieces. That's it. Um, the rest is contemporary, meaning since 1960, 65. Um, you know, in my research, the way I look at it is contemporary Western art begins with the founding of IAIA, the Indian Art School, 1962. And the founding of the Cowboy Artists in 1965. Mm. Those two moments in time add up to create the contemporary Western mm. art boom we've been in ever since. Mm-hmm. Which you, the 30 years prior to that were pretty fallow. Mm. Uh, if you look at Western art as being a nice, neat timeline that you can follow with movements and major players and so on, you know, once the Tau Society blows up in the late 20s, it's pretty hard to find the trail from there to those two institutions being founded, even though that was the most popular time for Western movies and TV shows, Mm -hmm. which was one of the thesis topics back in the beginning that Byron had suggested I look into. Problem is that's a topic for a a career long study. (laughs) That's not something you're going to answer in a a grad paper um, because it makes no sense. You know, at a time when the Western movies and Western TV shows were the most popular, far outweighing any other genre for a 30-year period of time, why was Western art not more popular? You know, I could see it being the kids that were interested in it, not the parents as much. And those kids turn into be the artists and the collectors that we see today. Right. Exactly right. Um, you know, and, and at that time, I guess the parents were into pop and abstract and yeah, whatever modern else. had become yeah. in vogue. It was a big problem for people like Dixon yeah. in the thirties cause they were competing against the modernists. So when I, when I teach the history of Western art to docents and collectors who ask me to do that, you know, I say, you know, after the, the death of the Tau society, uh, right around the time of the great depression beginning, So through the 30s, 40s, 50s, you have what I call the lone wolves. Mm -hmm. And they're not part of any group. Um, They're not associated with anything. Dixon, uh, N.C. Wyeth Mm -hmm. for the very beginning part of that. Olaf Wighorst. Benton and his own world. Yep. Um, W.R. Lee, Mm -hmm. um, who, you know, just as an aside, we have a major painting of his. And... um, he ought to be as equally famous as Remington and Russell, if not more so. I mean, mm-hmm. technically, he's a better painter than Russell for sure, and he's right there with Remington. Um, but he lived too long. That's my theory. Mm. He was still alive in 1955 when they were starting to write the first books on Western art history. And they weren't going to really emphasize him. He's still alive. Mm-hmm. But, you know, theoretically, this, you know, the school's still out on him or whatever. So he doesn't get in the first books in a major way. The guys who write the second books read the first books, and you know, <laughs> it's kind of a snowballing thing. He also didn't do much sculpture, if any, whereas Russell and Remington, you know, mm-hmm. are known to, particularly Remington, known to most people through sculpture. But that's an aside as well. But we were buying some major deceased pieces to just give us a little bedrock, yeah, round out the collection, and to show the shoulders of the. the grandparents and parents of Western art that the contemporary guys and gals were standing on. And, you know, we were looking, trying to look as objectively as we could. And again, having Byron help us and, um, and other people that we asked to weigh in, you know, who are we missing among the contemporary painters and sculptors um, that ought to be here? 
and you know what are a few key deceased artists and or specific pieces we might should look at mm -hmm. to anchor the collection um so by the time we opened in 2003 we had probably bought 50 or 60 pieces in the preceding three years that doesn't sound like that many but that's a lot of art yeah and these are good pieces so they're expensive and and most of them are big because right. the boss likes big pieces. Yeah, and it's a museum. They need big pieces. You got 14-foot walls. You're not going to yeah. put a 16 by 20 on the wall and have it blow you away. Right. Um, you know, we bought some pieces that were 8 by 18 feet, mm -hmm. like the Dixon. And, um, you know, so when we opened, we, we felt pretty good about what we had. Uh, we had mixed the historic and the contemporary together by subject. And that created some interesting juxtapositions. Um, but people would come in and say, where's the Remingtons and Russells? Mm. We said, well, we kind of pick up where they left off. And some people would say, well, hmm, let's go see what that looks like. That could be fun. And some people would say, well, you don't got any Remingtons and Russells. You must not have much. <laughs> so um, fast forward four years later, and um, – the original building had been built in such a way that it could be added on to easily. Mm -hmm. And that was, again, one of the founder's mandates was how do we expand, how do we expand, how do we expand? So the original 80,000 square foot building opened in 2003. Four years later, you know, I'm figuring 15, 20 years from now, we're going to be glad we did that. Yeah. <laughs> Four years later, <laughs> he walks in my office and says, I want to put 40,000 more square feet on the mm -hmm. booth. Okay, we're in the middle of building a 125,000 square foot science museum five miles up the street, and we're renovating a historic downtown building for the local history museum. And I still got two young kids that I'm running the Montessori in the mornings on my way to work and forgetting to pick up in the afternoon. <laughs> and um, I said, can we at least get the science museum done first? And then we'll worry about that. And he said, no, I might not live to see it. You know, at this point, he's in his early to mid-70s. Luckily, he's still with us in his mid-80s. But uh, he said, no, I might not live to see it. We need to do it now. Mm. And so we put 40 more thousand square feet on the booth. And at, at about that time, things really kind of line up where we get invited to belong to the Museums West Consortium, mm -hmm. which is the 14 largest and most important Western collecting museums. We become a Smithsonian affiliate museum. We add the 40,000 square feet. We've been buying some art along. People have been giving us art, which was one of the reasons he wanted to add the 40,000 square feet was we've been given some nice things and we didn't have a place to show them. Mm -hmm. Or we we're having to rotate them so often that he didn't like it. So we built a new wing and we decided to go the opposite direction in terms of the way it was hung from what we've been doing. So instead of having historic and contemporary pieces mixed together, we consolidated the historic pieces and borrowed many pieces from other people to create a historic introduction to Western art. Mm. Catlins from the Smithsonian, Remingtons and Russells from the National Cowboy and the Buffalo Bill and the Autry mm -hmm. and the other great museums and created this historical introduction. And then you have the traditional living artists who are doing work that looks like Remington Russell. The Cowboy Artist Manifesto says they exist to create art in the tradition of Remington and Russell. Hmm. And so that's what we have in, in the main part of the original building. In the other part, in the new part of the uh, building, new wing as I call it, you have the more contemporary style art. And my biggest fear is that people don't catch the fact that the traditional Western art by living artists is the same age as the contemporary mm. Western art or even newer than the contemporary mm. style Western art we're showing in the museum. It's not new and old. Mm -hmm. It's done at the same time, but it's new and old thinking. Mm -hmm. And that the more contemporary style artists the Kim Wiggins, the Ed Mells, the Donna Howe Sickles, you yeah, name it. Billy Shanks. Billy Shanks of the world are saying, if you guys think you're going to out Remington and Russell, Remington and Russell, you're starting out in a hole that you're not going to get out of. Why do that? You know, why beat your head against that wall? 
why not do something that's a little different, that has some social commentary to it, that has art historical references in it, that have social commentary or whatever it might be, mm-hmm. um, or, or just a different style, you mm-hmm. know, something that hasn't been done before. You know, don't fall into the cowboy going right, cowboy going left, Indian going right, Indian going left. You know, unless you're Howard Turpin and can paint that so damn well <laughs> that, that you can't deny that it's right. incredible. You're, you're starting out in a hole to begin with. And do you find the people that come visit the booth are drawn to one area more than the other? Or can you really t- tell that? Uh, anecdotally, I would say it's it's pretty damn even. There's a third who really like the traditional. There's a third who really like the contemporary. And there's a third that can like both. Mm-hmm. And what about the dud guys, the historic stuff? Um, that gets lumped in with the contemporary guys Got that it. are doing traditional style. Okay. Uh, although there are, you know, some people who really do pay attention to that and they love the historic stuff most. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a subset of that first third. Um, but those are relatively few and far between because those tend to be smaller pieces. They're not iconic examples of those artists work because, we're at the mercy of borrowing them from yeah, other museums course. and private collectors. So, you know, it's not like we have Downing the Nye Leader by Remington or, um, you know, Dash for the Timber by Remington or In Without right. Knocking by Russell, you know. Uh, although the one Russell that we have from the Buffalo Bill Museum making the Chinaman dance, being way politically incorrect, mm-hmm. is a pretty major painting for him. And, um, you know, we just ignore the PC part, the title part. So you have a, but you, because you deal with lots of contemporary Western artists, it seems to me that you really have a pulse on the market, maybe more than other people, even maybe more than gallerists. And if that's a true statement, do you see the Western art that's being produced being more toward this more contemporary bent? Well, Several kind of angles to follow up on what you're saying. I was on a panel last week at the Briscoe Museum, which is one of the museums and new 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 Western museums in San Antonio, Texas. They have an art show like many of these uh, Western museums do. Mm-hmm. And so uh, two weeks earlier, the Autry Museum in Los Angeles had had their show. And I had not been there, but I'd heard that they had a panel and everybody was just beating up the Western art market that, you know, things are going down, 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 down. It's going to crash and, you know, burn and there's not going to be any Western art mm-hmm. market and so on. And uh, apparently that got on a downward spiral among the people on the panel and just kept going. And so I was going to be on this panel at the Briscoe and Josh Rose, who runs Western Art Collector Magazine, was mm-hmm. going to be the moderator. And, you know, his job is to pump up the Western art market Mm -hmm. to say everything's great. Everything's rosy. Look at these examples Mm -hmm. of things that, you know, are happening that are exciting and show that the market's going up. And I said, yeah, but those are the exceptions that make the rules. The Western art market is a shrinking market. Collectors are dying faster than they're being replaced. Big collections are hitting the market now and are going to continue to hit the market for the next 10 or 15 years there's going to be a glut of Western art in the auction market, which cannot have any other effect than to depress prices for living artists and put pressure on the marginal galleries um, that they're not going to survive. And we've already lost a lot of galleries in the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. And the, the next 10 years look bleaker than the 10 years we've just been through. I said, so, you know, you can tell me all the positive nuggets that you want. It's a, Economically, if you look at it objectively, it's a shrinking market, it's a declining market, it's a downward spiraling market. But what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. That's what I want to talk about. And so he and I agreed that that's what we would try to orient this panel towards. And that's a lot of what your the answer to that question is, is how can we expose people to Western art? How can we get... We always say younger people, and Martin Greeley actually chimed in. He's one of the great painters in our in our generation, and he chimed in and he said, "It's not new. It's not 
young collectors because you, you don't get young collectors. I mean, people don't buy art till they're in their 50s. Yeah, generally, mid-40s. And we keep talking about young people and how do we get young people to collect. You're not. You're just not. You're beating your head against the wall. But how do you make sure when the current generation gets in that window, late 40s to early 50s, and thinks about collecting art, how do we make sure that Western art is part of it or at least they're aware of it or whatever it might be? So you're not going to get younger collectors, but you're going to get new collectors. Mm -hmm. And how do we get new collectors? And so we see that as a big part of our job at the Booth Museum to help support our living artist friends, our gallery friends, even our auction friends by bringing new people to the fold. And what we have seen time and time and time again is artists, um, collectors who are collecting at a relatively low or modest level they get involved in the museum, they get around other people that are collecting it, they go to some shows, they go to some studios, they get a little little backbone and you know uh, have some access to some resources. They collect more and better art ninety seven percent of the time. Mm -hmm. And so you know my question to the audience there, which had a number of gallerists in the in the audience, why would you not want to be sending your collectors to us? Why would you not want to be working with us and other similarly minded museums if 97% of the time they're going to be buying more and better art? Yeah, and that is true. And, you know. And we just sent you some. <laughs> you did. You did. And, uh, you know, the track record is pretty incredible. Um, you know, but it's difficult for the artists to trust outsiders, particularly um, the artists themselves, when they may sell around the, behind the back of the gallery. And, you know, traditionally, that's why galleries don't tell the artists who bought the pieces mm -hmm. and who their collectors are. But when they go to the museum shows, they're meeting them all and they're coming up going, hey, I have that piece, you know, the one with this or that mm -hmm. in it. And, you know, they're finding out who they are. And, um, you know, with Internet research and snooper websites, I mean, it's pretty hard to not be able to find somebody. Well, I think so one of the we all got to trust each other. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest things to help develop this market and some of the things that we're not really looking at uh, as a community is internationally. Right. Internationally, people love the West. That's true. They love native art. They love Western art. And I don't think we've done a good job of really getting that out to the world. We're just a small little component. And I don't think we've done any. Yes. Well, that's why we have to do things like this podcast. I think that's the other thing that has to be done for those people that are in this field is to use media that people don't use may or haven't used in the past that are now more accessible to a huge group of people like podcasts and YouTube and things like that. So people can see the content, understand what it is and see why people like yourself and myself, you know, have donated our lives work to a field that we find is very interesting. I think it's a vibrant field, but I don't disagree with you that the, at least in maybe in America, that uh, Western art is shrinking. I think a few things are shrinking. I think I think just owning things is shrinking to some oh, extent. Collect any collectible, and any anything, any any uh, category of collectibles has not recovered since two thousand seven. Yeah, except computer stuff. They, those continue to break records, and that's for computer games and things like that. Amazingly, well, but that's a pretty. <laughs> small niche market no it is i don't know where it'll be in yeah 20 years from now well, it'll be where rookie baseball cards were 15 years ago but yeah um, it's possible you know you look at, at the rise of heritage auction house that built its reputation on coins and baseball cards and now is one of the biggest players in the art world mm -hmm. um they um they're selling stuff at 60 70 cents on the dollar what they were selling it for 15 years ago or worse mm -hmm. for those areas of collectability and yeah. you know just yet they're doing very well people people who have the collector gene mm -hmm. are not as prevalent in the next generation as they were in the previous generation i mean we just know that i mean there's been enough studies and enough research to know that so what they tell us is they don't want stuff they want experiences right that's what you hear at least Okay, well, great. We got the greatest experience in the world, watching somebody paint mm -hmm. or talking to an artist about their painting and why they painted it, how they painted it, and what it means to them. 
and then engaging that viewer to say, what does it mean to you? Tell me about it. What do you get from it? And, and them investing themselves in the piece, and then they got to have it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to change it from a retail model to an experiential model in a lot of ways. And that's where I think the museum shows have led in that direction. Mm -hmm. But we can't have them be so successful and soaking up all the artwork that the galleries get left out of the deal because the galleries are so important from an educational standpoint mm -hmm. and helping new artists get on the scene in the first place to be recognized, like the young man that was in here when I walked right. in to do the podcast that you know, I think is a very talented artist. And um, you know, we, we have a piece that was given to us by a donor, um, a, a former gallery owner. Well, actually, he still owns a couple of galleries with his son. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had a gallery owner call me and say, I've discovered an artist who doesn't fit in my gallery, but needs to be in your museum. Mm. And I'm willing to buy a piece of his art and put it in the museum. That's mm. how strongly I feel about yeah. it. I mean, how often do you think that happens? Not very often. One time in 18 years to me. <laughs> I'll find one and do it for you, then you'll have to. Well, <laughs> well, you've kind of already done that. Yeah. <laughs> you've been very generous with us. Uh, but, well, it's um, a good organization. I, but I uh, get it. Um, it it's it's really a a topic that my fellow museum directors worry about you know where is their audience going to be 30 mm -hmm. years from now when you don't have anybody left who remembers Gina Roy mm -hmm. or who remembers even John Wayne or Clint Eastwood and are they still going to is that still going to drive people to be interested in western art because Every major Western art collector I know that I've ever interviewed, it starts with the movies. Yeah, though so they're still making them. I mean, Buster Scruggs, that was a Western movie. Well, but nobody under 50 went to go see it. Oh, I don't know about that. I Everybody in my in this gallery, and four or five of them were under 30, so well, you made on their it. own. Nope, <laughs> on their own. But maybe they have the interest because they work in a gallery that's right. Western-oriented. Right. Well, and did it motivate them to want to buy a Frank McCarthy? I don't know if it motivated him to do that, but we taught, we actually had discussions about how the book was done, you know, how they used the old fashioned book for the chapters and things. We actually had those discussions right? Uh, organically. It just kind of came right. up. So at least it made them think about it. Well, my friend Bruce Eldridge, who just retired as the director at the Buffalo Bill Museum and Cody said, it's nothing a couple of really great Western movies couldn't fix. Yeah, I can see that. You know, when you had the- um, Look at Dances with Wolves. Well, and Urban Cowboy. Yeah. Uh, those were- uh, needle shifting events when those movies came out. Is that going to happen again with a Western? I don't know. Um, what I do know is the power of the West itself, the landscape, mm -hmm. the vastness is still going to captivate. I don't care how old you are or, or what your tag of your generation is. Millennial X, Z, right. Y, I just took an artist from Bulgaria out for a nine-day driving trip through the Southwest. Mm. Now, he watched some Western movies when he was younger in Bulgaria, where mm -hmm. he's from, because that's what they filled up some of the TV channels with just to have programming. And he was as excited to go see Monument Valley as any person I've ever seen excited about going to see anything. Mm -hmm. And when we topped that ridge where he could see Monument Valley, he was overwhelmed. Two days later, when we went and toured George O'Keefe's house in Abiquiu, and he saw what she looked at out to her window, he bought a house in Abiquiu. Mm. Yeah, I get it. Sight Again, unseen. Like I said, coming internationally, I can see it as being a as a real feeder for this market. So, you know, as far as is there going to be a Western art market, I think yes, there there always will be because of the power of the West itself. And those kids who theoretically don't want to collect and don't want stuff but want experiences, they're going to want to go to the national parks, mm -hmm. Tetons, Yellowstone, Glacier, Bryce, Zion, mm -hmm. Grand Yosemite, Canyon. Grand Canyon, you name it. And they're going to want to have a relationship with that. They're going to buy houses in Vail. They're going to buy houses in Bend, Oregon. They're going to buy houses in Santa Fe. Tucson. <laughs> What are they going to put in them? Are they going to put their own photographs, prints? 
I, I think at some point, again, you get in that, yeah. that right age bracket, you're going to want to collect some art. Now, back to your another part of your question, which is what kind of art is it going to be? Right. They've been saying since the 1980s that the more contemporary style Western art was going to take over the mainstream. I mean, I can show you Southwest art from 1982 or 1983, and mm -hmm. you've been in it long enough to have seen it yourself, that Kim Wiggins and Donna House Sickles and Ed Mel and Tom Palmore and Billy Shank were going to be the big deals in Western art 10 years from now. That's 35 years ago, mm -hmm. 36 years ago. Hadn't happened yet. Well, I think Billy and Ed might say differently, but... <laughs> well, but... Um, the prices they're selling for don't touch the top three or four guys that are doing traditional. Well, that's probably true. The amount of work that's being sold as traditional style, I would say it's double or triple the amount of work that's being sold that's uh, contemporary. And the secondary market for contemporary is in the toilet mm -hmm. for all but one or two artists. There's too much of it out there and not enough people interested in it. Mm. So... Um, you know, theoretically, yes, that makes sense. Younger people are going to be interested in the more contemporary style work. And even the artists that I see, maybe it's just the artists that come to me, but the ones I see are definitely in a more contemporary bent of how they interpret the West and how they see it. Well, and part of that's, um, you know, being more exposed to that type of work and, and being aware that there's at least some market for it and not wanting to do the tried and true traditional thing. Um, but the traditional is still outselling the contemporary. Mm -hmm. You mean by auction records, museum shows, mm -hmm. gallery shows? Can that may relate to the age bracket of the people that are collecting it? Well, but that's where the money is. Yeah, no, it's true. But I mean, that will you know, Martin continue to Martin change. Greeley had a one man show, twenty pieces, sold one point eight million dollars worth of art in one night. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. John Coleman had a one-man show, bronzes and paintings, $1.67 million. I mean, those two individual shows for those two individuals doing very traditional work were the second and third highest selling shows in our business. Mm -hmm. One, and I'm talking a one artist show versus a, a hundred artist show mm -hmm. or an 80 artist show. Mm -hmm. And they're both pretty traditional. Yeah. So the, that's where the big money is, at least. Well, at least that's what's following it, yes. I mean, those are both quality artists as well. Well, um, you know, so I'll argue against myself for half a second and yeah. say, you know, Logan Ajez sold a painting at Scottsdale Art Auction this past weekend for $210,000. Yeah, with the premium 234 Right. And same with Mark Maggiore. Yeah, 99 k um, hundred, You know, pushing the $100,000 mark. Um, you know, Logan... In, in his quieter moments when I've talked to him has said his goal is to sell for what Howard Turkening sells for, which mm -hmm. is a million dollars. He wants to be the first contemporary Western artist to sell a piece for a million dollars. Well, well God could, bless him. Could easily happen if, at the rate he's going. Well, but <laughs> we'll you know, see. You really got to make But he's still he, under 30. I mean, he's still under 40. So eh, about there. Yeah. Know? 38, I think. And um, you really got to manage that career. Mm hmm. Uh, and he's going to have to start producing less pieces and less pieces that are so similar looking to the ones that are already out there. Mm. Uh, you know, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that that's part of what got Howard to his prices to there. You know, but he had this, he had an annual CA show, which was a dominant event in our, mm. in our business in those days. And he kept bumping those prices up pretty aggressively and there were still lots of names in the box. Mm. And so as long as there's still names in the box, you can jump in another price point. And there was still profit to be made. Um, you know, Martin hasn't pursued it as aggressively. And so it hasn't driven it up. But it's a good thing he didn't because he had taken a big hit in 07, 08, 09, 10. Mm -hmm. There's still meat on the bone. But... You know, a lot of times we have these discussions about the market of Western art. Mm -hmm. and we're really only talking about ten artists that for those that fit I into fit into those kinds of discussions. You know, for the for the average artist that's selling pieces in the let's say eight to twelve thousand dollar range, is that a mid price point? Yeah, I think so. Six to twelve, something like that. 
you know, they're the ones that in 07, 08 had to go get real jobs. Yeah. All my artists surprisingly made, uh, did well during 08, 09. Uh, Ed Mel actually had his best year ever in 09. Right. So. Well, but you're representing some pretty phenomenal artists. Yeah, I mean, I'm that's talk- true. Oh, no. For a lot of people, I'm yeah. talking about the middling and lower echelon yeah, artists. Yeah, no. Some of those washed out and never came back. Well, and some of them probably shouldn't have been trying to make a living in the first place. Yeah. I mean, it's another it's another area where I feel kind of self-conscious about artists coming to me for career counseling. Mm-hmm. Or particularly artists who come to me and say, should I quit my day job? Mm. And I say, if you have to ask me, the answer is obviously no. Yeah, I agree with that answer. Because the ones who are successful jumped in with both feet and yeah. had to do it. Yeah. They weren't thinking about, can I do it? Yeah. The... Again, I'll take the other side for half a second. Uh, probably the best story I ever heard about that was John Fawcett, who mm-hmm. got his start right here at the MO Club in their show. He was a veterinarian, and he was talking to his father-in-law, who had been a veterinarian or a doctor or something. And he said, uh, when you're in surgery, are you thinking about painting? Mm-hmm. He said, oh, yeah, all the time. Mm-hmm. He said, when you're painting, are you thinking about medicine? Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. He said, well... <laughs> Yeah, there's your answer. I can relate to that. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I thought you might. Yeah, very much so. So, you know, the question is, how can we grow the pie, not slice it in thinner slices? Mm. And unfortunately, some of my museum brethren at the bigger, more established museums do not see that as part of their job. Hmm. Their job is to collect, preserve, and interpret. And they're not in the outreach business. They're not in the helping artists or collectors business. They may run an art show where they sell the work of living artists to collectors who may be their patrons, but it's, they don't see that as part of their greater mission to hmm. make Western art a bigger field or help collectors or any of those things. We're putting together a summit through the Museums West Consortium, those 14 you know, biggest, most important Western collecting museums mm-hmm. for next year in Denver. Mm-hmm. And I've suggested, you know, part of the program ought to be around this issue of helping collectors, helping artists get together, helping build collectors, uh, helping them take the next level, helping educate them, you know, those kinds of issues. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to get our hands dirty with that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I may wind up proposing a follow-on one-day summit following that event, which they're going to invite every museum in the country that has anything to do with anything Western. Mm. If you have anything Western in your collection, you deal with Western issues and scholarship and collecting, come to this meeting in Denver, and we're going to talk about topics of mutual interest. Mm. Well, how is not growing the audience and growing the collector base not part of top, a topic of mutual yeah, interest. clearly is. But I'm fighting uphill on that one. So what I may wind up doing is saying to the galleries, the artists, and the collectors, come meet with the museum people who are going to be there anyway for a day, and let's talk about how can we make the pie bigger. Mm-hmm. What are the strategies we should all be using? Because even if you're a collector, you don't want to see this market go in a tank. Whatever you invested in it has gone with it, which is not why you buy it. But you'd like to know you could get your money out of it or some of your money out of it if you had to. Right. Or even grow. Well, that's a bonus. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, I don't buy art as a collector to go, oh, it's going to go up. I think it's a fool's journey to do that. Right. I think you buy things because it enhances your life, your emotions, and you can't live without it. Well, it's got to pass the Seth Hopkins pink fuzzy slippers test. Okay, give us that. Well, you're padding around your house Sunday morning. You got your pink fuzzy slippers on. You got a cup of coffee, yeah. New York Times crossword puzzle, uh-huh. looking for a comfortable place to sit. And out of the corner of your eye, you spy a piece of art that you get to live with. Yeah. And it's not that you own it, you're the custodian of it for this generation because mm-hmm. it's going to outlive you by two or 300 years. Right. And you get a slow, silly grin that creeps over your face because you're the one who gets to live with it for this generation. Mm -hmm. And you see things in it that you never saw before, even a year after you've owned it. Yeah. And a different light hits it one day from a different angle than it's hit it before, and it looks different. And you just have that slow, silly grin, and you say, yeah, it's mine for now. (laughs) And you get to live with it and love it and enjoy it. 
And maybe you even get to know the artist. That passes the pink fuzzy slippers test. Yeah. And that's the only reason to buy a piece of art. Yeah. And I think on that we end this podcast. So everyone out there listening or watching, you need to find your pink slippers and you need to find those pieces of art that give you that smile and the grin. I know I have them in my house. I look at my art every day. I don't uh, look at it for any other reason for joy. And that's what it should be about. Absolutely. And, um, you know, in my case, I have that, but I have the added layer of I've been in most of the studios of the artists that I have work in my house. And, of course, I have access to it like most people don't. But if they come to the gallery or at a museum show or wherever that they can come and encounter these artists, the joy of knowing you're also enjoying that art, but you're putting their kids through college or that's right, or you're um, you know sending their grandkids to private school or whatever it might right, be, you're supporting them, you're supporting them and putting groceries on their table for their family. You know what a bonus that is, mm -hmm. and you know bar none, the greatest people in this country make and collect Western art. Yeah, in 18 years of doing this, I've met five jerks. You tell me what other business you could be in that has that kind of number. Nope. I can't think of one. And I did a little uh, panel discussion during our gala this year with some artists and collectors, and I titled it Western Art, the Only Business Where the Customers Buy Dinner. <laughs> By the way, do you know what? I'm buying you dinner tonight at the MO Club. <laughs> cool. <laughs> but when the collectors and the artists go out to dinner, it's true. The collectors buy. It's true. They feel like it's a, a real privilege that they're getting to spend time with these creative masters. And they're the customer. Yep. Yeah, the yeah. artist thought it'd be buying them dinner. Yeah, no. But it doesn't work that no, way. That's a fantastic. It's, it's another thing that just world. makes it an incredible, incredible, yeah. unique thing that we're involved in. Yeah. And thank God we are. Yeah. Seth Hopkins, Booth Museum. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Everybody out there, look for the Andy Warhol show that'll be coming up. That's going to be fantastic. I will even come out and attend that one. And look for my book. Yeah, I will. And just let us know what it is, and we'll get the information out to people that are watching this or listening to it. Cool. Excellent. Thank you, Seth. Yes, sir. Land Gallery, located for over 26 years in Tucson, Arizona, specializing in antique Native American art, early Western art, including the famed Maynard Dixon, as well as modern art. You can find everything online at medicinemangallery.com. There's over 6,000 objects to select from. Also, the Charles Bloom Murder Mystery Series, written by yours truly, me, Mark Sublett. There's six books in this series, and they follow the protagonist Charles Bloom through all the intrigue of the art world set in Santa Fe and the Navajo Nation. These can be found on Audible, eBooks, Amazon, and of course, the gallery at medicinemangallery.com.